Welcome back to my channel, everybody. This week, we're going to go over the construction of the Satana that I was wearing with that ruff that you saw a few weeks ago. I have been working on this particular research project for morning wear in 16th century Rome for about a year or better. I started sewing the project itself at least a year ago, just before I got injured and wanted to kind of go over how things have changed. So to start, I didn't see any references to corsetry, so I decided to go and heavily pad stitch the bodice. I'm cutting out multiple layers of cotton batting to act as that padding. The European extent garments I've seen don't have cotton woven into fabric very often, but you do see some examples of basically cotton wadding used to pad things out. So first step is cutting out a couple layers of this and then some more layers so I can start assembling the pieces. There's a lot of cutting and a lot of pieces that went into making this particular dress. In my experience, cotton batting does not have a ton of grain to it, at least the way it's made modernly. It's more like needle punched together, almost like felt. So you can get creative with the directions you lay your pattern pieces out in order to get the best use of the fabric. Normally I would have been a-okay with just using one layer of this cotton batting and then stitching that down to a layer of maybe a linen canvas or a medium weight linen, something to try and help add that little bit of extra stability and keep the cotton from stretching or warping over time. But with this particular experiment, I wanted to try doing multiple layers of batting just to kind of see how that would behave, if it would be comfortable to wear. Um, how does that round out my shape versus just a single layer, at least over my torso. So I need to lay out my batting and cut out a second one of these layers. And then I'm going to do a little stitching to make them act as one piece once I'm done with this. So these construction techniques are actually based on the second half of the 16th century and into the early 17th century. If you're trying to date this and decide if it's going to be a good use for your own recreation projects. You can see here where I didn't have quite enough on that last piece of batting in order to fully get the entire piece I wanted in one go. So I'm actually just gonna piece the inner batting. It's not that big of a deal and no one's even gonna know except for all of you watching this on the internet. Because batting can be stretched out all on its own and molded and shaped, it can also get stretched out by the feet on your sewing machine. So what I chose to do to help keep the batting in the structure that I wanted was I hand sewed everything together for this inner layer. First, I needed to join together the three pieces where I pieced one layer of my batting. And I'm just kind of doing some lazy 
almost pad stitches, whip stitches sort of things that are going both through the layer underneath as well as joining the two pieces together. This made for a really strong join and by the time I eventually got to finishing this garment, it was actually starting to kind of mat together. It was really easy to then move from doing this little joining stitch to starting to do some actual pad stitching on the padding to try and keep the different layers together. I just tried to make this really quick and as even as I could, you're going to see the stitches become a little bit more of that slanted regular basting that you see from pad stitches. I did do an entire tutorial on how to do pad stitching for this sort of garment when I was working on the pad stitching for my Lady Loki outfit. So if you are interested in a more in-depth tutorial, I'm going to link that down in the bio and it will be in the playlist that we link at the end. One of the other things I needed to get started when I was putting the pad stitching and time out was actually cutting out the lining. I had decided to cut out all of my fashion fabric out of an existing pattern that I knew fit at the time. And that was so that a couple of us could try and get outfits out of the same roll of fabric, but I'd neglected to do any of my linings or interlinings at the time. So once I was done cutting that out, I started using it to line the inside of my bodice. I'd first started by doing the same process that you see me use in my bell cosplay, where I stitched the lining pieces together and then I started wrapping the fashion fabric over the edge and then the lining just goes and gets set in just inside that fashion fabric. On this dress, I honestly did not feel it was necessary to do more than one layer of the linen canvas for the interlining, so that's what I did. There is no pad stitching or anything like that over the small of my back. We don't have sway back or any of those sorts of concerns to worry about doing some adjustments in fit or padding. So that was why that choice is there, and part of why assembling the back piece became my project to work on when the pad stitching was going into timeout because it was just taking a while. I did set my lining in with pins on this first, rather than just basting everything in and then stitching it down with a little more detail and focus, mostly because of all of the bias that goes into it. Side seams have bias to them, the arm straps have bias to them. It became a little bit of a concern for me to just start basting stuff down before I'd had a chance to kind of stretch and put the bias in place for where I wanted it to be. So to each their own, if you prefer to just baste everything in first, I'm not gonna stop you here on the internet. A really handy tip if you're trying to get things to stretch correctly around a curve is to go and just do a couple little clips around that curve. Make sure you're staying inside what you are considering to be your seam allowance and that will help the fabric to stretch and spread out more around that curve. This is if you've got something that you're trying to expand out rather than in. It makes more sense when you see it on screen. <laughs> 
a small construction note, a lot of the linings on bodices and these dresses doesn't appear to have been heavily dyed. Black lining like this probably would not have happened in the time period, just because of how expensive black dye stuff was. But it is something I am choosing to do for my modern purposes. Um, frequently you would see linings that show being something really beautiful or something that's intended to contrast and linings you didn't see was often undyed kind of generic fabric so if you just want to line yours with something that is not exciting or doesn't perfectly match and it's kind of a neutral you are in great company with folks that were working on stuff in the 16th and 17th century Flat lining garments like this, I know it can feel a little bit more finicky, especially when you're used to modern sewing methods of being able to bag line something where you just kind of stitch everything together and then turn it right side out to iron. But it really helps to give the period silhouette. It also helps things lay a little bit flatter and cleaner around the body and around the support structures that might be in use. So if you don't feel like flat lining, I understand, but it does help to kind of create that period aesthetic that you're going for when you're making garments like this. I'm using an invisible hemming stitch for most of my flat lining right here. You can also use a whip stitch just fine. I found that this gives me fewer floating threads out to be caught, but it does tend to lead to things puckering if you don't do the stitches close enough together, especially when you're dealing with things around biases or curves. So just keep that in mind around those spots you might want to switch to something more like it a whip stitch itself. So right about here is where I ended up getting injured and this got put in a box for six months. So when I came back out, I had cut panels for my skirt, but they hadn't been sewn together. So I just sewed those together into a tube on the sewing machine with the cutout that I usually do at the center front for my point. And I decided I didn't want to deal with trying to pleat this in on top of all of that hand sewing and flat lining. So I'm going to do the more period cartridge pleat style. But at the same time, I also couldn't necessarily support the skirt being fully lined at the moment. So the best solution I had was to use some of this braid, which I had picked up for hems from Burnley and Trowbridge. And I was going to stitch over the raw edge at the top of my skirt and then turn that under to encase all of the raw edges inside the braid and stitch the skirt onto the bodice. It's a method you see in later sewing so I figured it wouldn't hurt to give it a try for this one as an accommodation for myself. As you can see, I left the bodice open thinking I might just pleat it into that bodice and then stitch it, the lining on top of the raw edges of the top of the skirt. But it ended up being a little bit thick and bulky when I started trying to add those layers in and think about it. Rather than having the bulk be in my waistline, I preferred the idea of having it just below to help the skirts flare out some more. So once I made the choice to not just pleat my skirt directly into the bodice waistline, I had to go back in and finish putting in the lining. That way I would have a finished edge to start stitching my skirt onto. 
Once I had all of the lining put into the front of my bodice, I then had a basis to put my skirt onto. The thing with the skirt is, is that it's a cotton brocade, but it's one that was really, really hard to source. It took me a couple of years, honestly. Um, it's a whole adventure all on its own for how I came to find this fabric. And I had cut the skirt to be just long enough, maybe with a very narrow hem. So to help protect the edge of the skirt hems over time, and to make sure it stayed long enough as I went through hemming things, I decided to put guards along the bottom of my skirt. Guards are a really period practice to try and help your skirts last longer and keep them from getting super dirty. So I just used this velvet remnant that was in my stash and I cut enough strips to add to Lady Loki as well. So I opted to just use the measurement for the width of my ruler, cut those into little snips. And honestly, the easiest way to do these strips and keep them on grain is to just rip them. So I squared up the edge and then started ripping strips, which sounded super terrifying. And I decided to give you this lovely voiceover and music instead of listening to the cries of the velvet. Of course, if you want to just be basic and cut the velvet along the ground fabric to try and keep it from wiggling on you, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, from my time working in fabric stores though, this was the consistent way we kept this particular type of velvet on grain for the store itself. So if it's good enough for my former corporate overlord, it's definitely good enough for this project. If you're doing this, you can honestly also measure out the length that you need to go around your skirts. I cut extra so that I would have enough to do this project and like I said, Lady Loki, as well as maybe doing some different decorative pieces on some other projects. And this is when I took my bodice out of time out again. I needed to get the shoulder strap sewn together. I'd put the linings in and I'd left the shoulder straps a little bit long with the intention of making sure that I got everything centered and correct on the top of my shoulder seam. I then procrastinated doing that for a long time and put the dress back in a box, brought it back out, and backstitched the dress once I finally decided after a fitting that I had everything in the right place. If you are wanting to know how to do the eyelets that I used, in order to be able to stitch the shoulders and make sure they were in the perfect place. I've got a tutorial on doing eyelets with rings, which is what I did here. Um, I'll link that down in the description as well so you can go and get a more in-depth look at that since I didn't spend a lot of time recording it. To get rid of the excess, I just marked where the pins were with some pink chalk to make sure it didn't disappear on me, and then started making sure everything was even between the two sides of my bodice. I didn't want to have one shoulder strap be much longer than the other since I'm relatively proportional in that regard. After getting all of the excess padding and structural pieces kind of clipped away from the seams. I was able to sew everything together and then spend a little bit of time getting the lining pieces to overlap and just make this a really easy sewing portion of my project. Make sure that when you're going through stuff like this that you're waxing your threads. It'll help keep them strong while you're going through this many layers of fabric and braiding the thread with your stitches. <laughs> 
Now that I've gotten all of the braid attached to the top waistline of the skirt and finished attaching the guards to the very bottom, I was actually able to start doing the pleating that it's going to take for me to attach the skirt and the bodice together. I did do an entire instep tutorial with fabric that isn't necessarily quite this dark and lighting that's a little bit brighter if you're wanting to see some really great detail on what's going on. So I'm going to link that down in the description as well as the playlist that that's part of for doing clothing and tailoring from the 16th century. So check those out if you're wanting to get a lot of in-depth looks on how to sew those together. Otherwise, if you want the cliff notes, I kind of subdivide the pleats down at half and half and half until they are the size I want. And then I whip stitch the pleats onto the edge of my bodice. I do leave an opening at the tops of one of my skirt slits in between the panels. That way I've got a way to get in and out, as well as a way to access pockets or other things I might need over time. So those slits will just get hand sewn. I usually put it into one of the skirt seams to make my life easier. That leads to having fewer pleats in the front and a lot of gorgeous pleats in the back that create sort of this trained look without fully cutting in a train. So a year after I started sewing this outfit for myself, I finally finished my 16th century Roman dress. I love this style. I love the black and white aspects of it. The beautiful patterns from the brocade that got matched and centered perfectly between the skirts and the bodice. And I even love the sleeves, which are going to be their own separate video if you're wondering where those came from. So stay tuned for that sleeve video. And in the meantime, tell me what projects you've been putting off finishing and what your plan is to get them done. I would love to hear about it in the comments. And I hope you have a fantastic day. Like the video if you want to see more content like this. And you can definitely subscribe to get that same effect. Have a great one. Bye.